Yes. Okay. So welcome everybody to the Prostate Cancer Lab. We're very excited to have uh, Dr. Michael Snyder with us. He is the chair and the depart of the Department of Genetics uh, at Stanford. Um, he is also um, uh, a very well um, published um, author, um, most notably the uh, genomics of uh, personalized medicine, what everyone needs to know. His research has um, spanned many different areas. He was the first to perform large-scale functional genomics in any organism and has developed many technologies in genomics and proteomics. Um, he's uh, developed the proteome chip, high-resolution tiling arrays for the entire uh, human genome, methods for global mapping of transcription factor binding sites, de novo genome sequencing of genomes using high throughput technologies in RNA-seq. Uh, and these technologies have been used for characterizing genomes, proteomes, and regulatory works. And so, uh, Mike, that's come directly from your, from your biography on your site. Some of it I know, some of it I don't know. Um, but I, I, I mentioned that just because um, you have some patients here that um, uh, and researchers, et cetera, that are bioinformaticians, and that's going to mean something to them. Um, your research has also gotten into uh, HIT training, and uh, we have talked a lot about HIT uh, relative oh, to other training. Um, Rick Stanton, who's on the call here, is a co-founder of the Prostate Cancer Lab bioinformatician from Amgen, three years at Human Longevity, and he's uh, sporting his, uh, his his guitar there. Uh, <laughs> He's, uh, he's, he's uh, really interested in HIT uh, versus uh, LSD, long oh. distance training. Um, oh, wow. So anyway. Uh, yeah, cool so, study so, there. Great. Yeah, so you, uh, you've, got, you've got a lot of really uh, uh, interested people. And so before we go, before we get into your presentation, I do want to just mention a disclaimer, and that is the information and opinions expressed on this uh, call and in our website or during discussions and presentations, both verbal and written, are not intended as healthcare recommendations or medical advice by the Prostate Cancer Lab, its principals, presenters, participants, or representatives for any medical treatment, product, or course of action. You should also consult a doctor about your specific situation before pursuing any healthcare program, treatment, product, or other course of action that might affect your health. And so with that, Legalese, I will turn it over to Mike. Who, uh, Brian, made... we should also say that this this canon will be made public, so that anybody knows that that uh, we're going to be recording and making this public. Yes, thanks, okay. Brad. Okay, great. Well, um, and I might just add to that by saying I'm not an MD. Uh, I'm a hundred percent conflicted in everything I'm going to tell you in terms of startups that have spun off from some of the work that we're doing here. So I will tell you, um, I, I loaded about 20 minutes of slides and to give you a flavor for the kinds of work we do. Uh, and it's all revolving around big data, trying to use big data to solve biological problems. And probably our flagship work is the one I'll tell you about, which is really using big data to try to transform healthcare and monitor health. And, and uh, we're trying to be a bit upstream, I think, of where this focus group is. Uh, but we do do some work on on taking on certain um, uh, you know cases that that we do try to solve, I suppose. So anyway, um, we think the healthcare system is broken as it currently works. It's really more sick care rather than healthcare. And even when you practice healthcare, if you think about it, it's kind of archaic the way we do it. You typically get in a car to travel to a physician. You show up at the doctor's office that pretty much looks the same as it did 40 years ago with a few new gizmos. They'll draw a very large aliquot of blood using a needle that typically hurts. Uh, from all that blood, they usually don't make very many measurements, and then they'll make decisions about your health based on population averages. And we think all of these steps can be dramatically improved. And so, and, and that's really been a focus of our work. And I'll tell you about some of the latest stuff, which I think you could see how it might apply to this particular group. It should lead to a fun discussion. With regards to this last point about population health, um, you've probably been told since you're little that your normal 
temperature when you put a thermometer in your mouth is 90.6. But if you actually look at the data that's out there, it's more like 97.5. But the more important point is there's a spread. This is the 25th quartile, 94.6. And this is the 75th quartile, 99.1. So that means if your normal baseline is here at 94.6, and you go to physician's office today and they measure at 98.6, they'll tell you you're healthy, you're normal. But if you're up four degrees over your baseline, we would argue you're not healthy. Something's probably off. And so that's sort of a big part of what we do. We try to actually follow people's baseline and look for these shifts. And so a number of years ago, actually 13, a little over 13 on me and now 10 for the cohort, we, we got involved in the idea of trying to use big data to, to see if we can probe people's health. And um, basically, you know, your health is influenced by your, your DNA, your genome, and then lots of other things, your activity, as you guys were referring to earlier, the food you eat, stress, um, all these environmental responses, all these impact your health. And we can, we're in a world where we can quantify a lot of this, some easily, uh, like your genome and your, your activity. Some is still clunky, but it's still quantifiable. But probably equally important, we can quantify the effects of these things by doing these deep data measurements on people. So there's been a revolution in, in DNA sequencing and, and proteomics was mentioned earlier, this uh, using mass spectrometry and other methods to be able to profile proteins and metabolites and lipids out of your blood. So, so starting about, as I say, 13 years ago and then 10 for most of the cohort, it's the smallest group, 109 people. We, we've been sequenced, we sequence their genome once, but then we'll basically out of their immune cells called peripheral blood monocyte cells, measure their epigenome, transcriptome, proteome, and then out of the blood plasma. So that's the part without the cells, we'll measure protein and cytokines, which are important immune molecules. I'm sure this group knows metabolites and lipids. And on top of that, we follow their microbiome. We do deep clinical testing as well and questionnaires. And then we have a number of advanced tests, stress psychocardiograms, and a variety of glucose control measurements. Because I'm, I'm actually type 2 diabetic myself. <laughs> it was predicted from my genome sequence and then got picked up through the profiling. <clears throat> anyway, we, we do a lot here. And then we do a lot with wearables, which is what I think Brian asked me to talk about. And that's what will be the emphasis of this. So, so we, we do these deep data collections on people. And then we also do it longitudinally. That's the second aspect. We'll sample people every three months while they're healthy. And then if an adverse event comes along, like viral infection, and there have been other things as well, we'll take more samplings. And, and the goal is to try and understand what does a healthy profile look like? How does it change over time? How does it compare between different people? What happens when people first get ill? And importantly for, I guess, trying to transform the healthcare system, can these advanced technologies like genome sequencing, wearables, be better used to manage people's health? And with regards to this last point, basically, just in the first three and a half years, we had 49 major health discoveries, meaning we, we caught some with early lymphoma. It spanned a wide range of area, hemocology, oncology, cardiovascular, metabolic, so on and so forth. So we caught some with early lymphoma, two people with these pre-cancers that can convert to aggressive cancers, um, <clears throat> two people with serious heart issues, one was picked up by genome sequencing, another by wearables, and so on and so forth. And that's the, these are all found pre-symptomatically, meaning we, were, we could see things are off before they had symptoms. And again, we, the way we like to think about this is that if the way we follow people's health now is like a five-piece jigsaw puzzle, five pieces out of a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle. We're trying to take more like five or 600 pieces so we get a clearer picture of their health. And, and so that's uh, what we're up to. And, and again, these are all found pre-symptomatically and no one technology found this. It's just a, 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 often the combination of genome sequencing plus blood markers, especially lymphoma. That was by both imaging and seeing so, several markers off. So, um, this is what we've been running for a while. Uh, uh, and then we, we did spin off a company to do a medical version. What I showed you was a research version. And then a number of years ago, we have this company called QBio. So you may have heard of it. And, and they, they're doing a medical version, but they're also adding in whole body MRI. And um, 
this we think is pretty important. The medical establishment these days will tell you, you know, if you ask any physician, should you do a whole body MRI? Pretty sure Brian can comment on this 100% of them will say, no, absolutely not. And the reason is because uh, everybody has nodules. Women have them in their ovaries, men in their prostate, as this crowd probably knows. And if you ask me, I'll tell you, uh, you absolutely should do a whole body MRI. The, the key isn't whether you have nodules, the key is whether you have any growing nodules. And the way you know that is by the longitudinal profiling. So we actually caught, all these are found pre-symptomatically, early ovarian cancer, prostate cancer, cardiovascular disease. And through the longitudinal profile, we even picked up a case of early pancreatic cancer. This is from the first 100 plus people and so on and so forth. Again, all found pre-symptomatically. So we think these big data dives can better find what's going on. So we've been doing, to, to the main point of, of I think, uh, me being here, we're doing a lot with the sort of remote monitoring. And um, this, I think, could also fit into lifestyle things that, that you were interested in talking about, like um, exercise, the effects of exercise. So so we got involved in this a number of years ago before the Apple Watch was out. It was about, I think, eight years ago now. Um, we we got involved with wearables but when they're mostly just fitness trackers. And we thought, well, these are probably pretty powerful health monitors. So we actually worked with a watch called Basis. It doesn't even exist now. But um, they uh, we, we put these on people to follow them. And I'll talk about a microsampling, which I think this group might find interesting as well. Um, so we, we, we basically, wearables, you may know, there's tons of them out there. They're mostly in the form of smartwatches or rings. And um, they're powerful because they measure all kinds of important physiology, like heart resting heart rate, heart rate variability, skin temperature, blood oxygen. Some of them uh, are accurate, some of them less accurate. Uh, some of them aren't, aren't accurate at all, like the blood oxygen and blood pressure, some of the devices do that. They're, they're generally not that accurate, but they're fine for picking up changes, the delta we like to say. So anyway, the, these devices are powerful because they'll measure you 24 seven, 365 days a year. And so as long as you keep them charged. And, and so we um, you know, put these on our cohort, right away discovered you could tell when people are getting infectious disease, this might interest this group. Um, and we figured it out because actually I've detected my Lyme disease pre-symptomatically because my, my heart rate went up and my blood oxygen dropped. This is picked up with a pulse oximeter, although you can now get it from a watch. Uh, again, pre-symptomatically, we saw these shifts. I knew something was up. And two weeks earlier, I'd been in an area where I'm pretty Lyme infested. And um, I later did get symptoms off and on. I went to a physician who, who saw my, my immune cells called monocytes rep and, and recommended penicillin. I said, no, I need doxycycline and um, got a little tense, but he did give in and, and uh, cleared it right up. And then when I got back, I tested, I was Lyme positive. And so, <laughs> yeah, go ahead. That's funny. <laughs> yeah, so no, most physicians are a little... Um, resistant to hearing from their patients. <laughs> um, uh, uh, you know, here I was telling them, no, I need doxycycline. I, I was in Norway as well. Um, yeah, anyway, it was awkward, but it, it worked out just fine. But it's well controlled. I given blood just before I left. You can tell I measure myself. Well, I forgot to say, if you look up, I'm wearing these four smartwatches and these hearing aids I have, they are for hearing, but they act your sensors as well. They can follow my interactions, my... Um, uh, um, yeah, believe it or not, my physiology as well. So, so again, these are powerful. And then we, I won't show you the data for this, but we went on to show that you could tell when you're getting a respiratory viral infection in advance of symptoms because your resting heart rate jumped up. And that turns out to be generally true that, uh, yeah, we can see your, your heart rate will jump up in advance of symptoms, your resting heart rate. And we showed it, I had four, even an asymptomatic case, four times I was infected, every single time that popped up, same with other members of the cohort. And so, as you know, COVID has come along. We have all these waves, this is a year old now, but we're still running around 45,000 cases a day, which is an underestimate since people have stopped reporting. Um, and, um, you know, we wanted to see if we could detect COVID with a smartwatch. You'll see where this is going and why it's relevant, I think, to this group. But 
we, uh, when COVID hit, we quickly partnered with Fitbit, enrolled 5,300 people. And it turns out 32 of them had had COVID while wearing their Fitbit. And they had a diagnosis day and a symptom day. This is our very first case. So this is resting heart rate. And here's a diagnosis day. Here's a symptom day. And you can see their resting heart rate jumped up nine and a half days prior to symptom onset. We have a real-time detection system I'll show you in a minute that can track your baseline, looks for this jump up in resting heart rate. And it works. It turns out 80% of the time we can pick up this jump in heart rate and the median is four days in advance of symptoms. And it works because COVID has a long pre-symptomatic period. So we can tell you when you're getting COVID by this and, and to, then to implement it. So this is meeting four days prior to symptom onset. So we now have this real-time alerting system. You're welcome to sign up. Let's see, there's, there's the, well, maybe Brian, you can send it around the group. I'll send you the email. Sign up for the study if you're interested. Yeah, <clears> I think a, to, a lot of folks probably will. Yeah, we're trying to improve this uh, algorithm. And so um, we what this does is it follows you on a circadian pattern, meaning you know, time of day, we'll see if you have an abnormally high heart rate. It also integrates a little bit of sleep and other information. I want to bring in heart rate variability. It's been tricky to get data from the companies. But basically, it it works same number, 80% of the time. We'll it'll give a red alert. Now you have to click on it. Soon you won't have to click on it, but right now you have to click on the app every day to see if you're a green day or a red day. And this is in fact, one of our first cases, this individual, um, and we shift time shift dates, it's not real dates, but <clears throat> they it's real red alerts and stuff. Uh, here's their symptom day. They were diagnosed the next day, but they were getting red alerts for three days prior to symptom onset. Uh, it works on Apple, works on Fitbit. It'll work on all the devices. Again, it's following your, your general circadian pattern, looking for this. If you have a, a, a signal that's unusually high for an unusually long period of time, it will get, trigger these red alerts. And, and it even works on asymptomatic cases. So here's an individual. Um, uh, we think same number, 80% of the time. They, they were This individual was diagnosed here but they were getting red alerts for two weeks prior to symptom onset. And the same for Apple, I can show you one of those too. Now I wanna emphasize it's not specific for COVID, okay? So this is a jump up and it's mostly built around resting heart rate. And the number one trigger of these signals is actually workplace stress. Intense exercise, not your usual jog because we build uh, this around normal things. But if you run a marathon, your heart rate will be up for several days afterwards and that'll trigger it. Uh, I'll be honest, I don't know how to do with a lot of folks who where you have a trouble with stable baseline. That's why it fails 20% of the time. But these stressors can all trigger other infections too, of course, even a mycoplasma, pick this up. So, so it, we're still, that's why we want to bring in more data to get it more and more specific. It did work on me. I had a particular family stress event that led to these two red alerts. And then when I was getting ready to go to New York City for a trip, I woke up that morning, I was a little bit congested. I wasn't sure, is it allergies? Am I coming down with something? You know, that twilight zone this time of year, we we'll probably all go through this. I just, I've been going through it, you know, every April, I'm get a little congested. Is it allergies? Am I getting something? So I did a COVID antigen test as negative. <clears throat> I looked at my smartwatch and I was positive. So what I do, I went ahead and went on the trip. I went to New York City. Before I can go to the meeting, I have to get tested. And sure enough, I'm bright positive. So I actually wasn't able to go to the meeting. I spent a whole week in a tiny little hotel room in New York, all because I listened to my antigen tests and not my smartwatch. So it's more sensitive than an antigen test. You only need two beats per minute increase over your baseline to, to pick up the signal. But uh, it's not as specific. I obviously didn't know it was COVID. I knew something was up, but I didn't know it was COVID. Now I know allergies don't trigger this. So if I see a red alert, I don't worry about it. Here's this micro sampling. I'll just spend a few minutes on this. This is super cool. You guys might like this. So um, basically, and, and I know what this is going to sound like, but this actually does work. But the idea is that you would do take little droplets of blood, mail them in, and we would run deep tests on them. So we, we've done that. Uh, we spent six years developing this. Uh, 
that really require getting the right matrix uh, and defined fixed volumes. And so in the end, we settled on two kinds of devices. Mitra is another one called Tasso, where you absorb very fixed volumes. You then fed exit to our lab and we'll do these deep profiles where we'll look at all your lipids, metabolites, proteins. I won't share the data. The proteins are quite stable with the format we've set. Same with the metabolites. There's a few that are off. Lipids a little less so. But in the end, we can measure over 2,200 molecules in people's blood. And some of these are a big deal. Like we can measure, we do targeted assays for cortisol. And these are immune markers, these cytokines and various important hormones. And so we can actually do, if you will, this remote sampling. We're trying to Amazon, Amazonize, if you will, healthcare where you would mail this in. And I'm not saying all healthcare will be done at home, but there's a certain amount that could be like the monitoring and this, this micro sampling. And, um, and it's not going to replace physicians, by the way. It's only going to help them, we think, these kinds of activities. Anyway, we did some fun studies. I think the group might like this, and you'll see where this is going. We had 32 people drink the shake that you can buy in CVS and most grocery stores called Ensure. It doesn't taste very good, in my opinion. But um, you you basically take a sampling. You know, We had them sample, do the micro sampling before they drank it, and 30 minutes, 60 minutes, two hours, four hours after drinking this thing. And then we, as I say, we're doing the micro sampling. And they did this in the morning what, before it well fasted. And this is not a surprise, hundreds of molecules shifted, okay? That's what you would expect. But we can track it. We can follow pretty important glucose regulatory molecules, uh, other inflammatory markers, things like this in response to the shake. And the cool result is shown here. Everybody reacted differently to the shake. And I think this could be pretty relevant for this audience. Um, so each box is a different person. This is just showing carbs. I could show you amino acids, free fatty acids, what have you. These are three carbohydrates. Look at this person here. This, their carbs plummet. They really go down after drinking the shake. This person's carbs skyrockets. Skyrockets up, up. There's another person goes down. Let's see. This person doesn't change too much at all. Here's a person who goes down. So everybody's behaving differently. And in the end, we could classify people into five categories. And it's pretty cool. So gray is the average, these gray balls here. And look at this category over here. In this group here, this, this group, their inflammatory markers go down after drinking the shake. So that shake actually you know, reduces inflammation in this group. But for these groups, this one over here and this one here, their inflammatory markers go up meaning the shake is pro-inflammatory. So it's having very different effects on different people. And that makes sense, right? We all react to food differently, but here's a pretty simple mixture. I have to confess, I didn't expect it to be this different for something as simple as this. And um, so we think that's powerful. And then we can combine all the stuff. This is the ultimate. So we, we took one person, they, they sampled themselves every hour for seven days, every waking hour. And basically, we could track their cortisol, all the stuff. And they're wearing a smartwatch for all this. They were doing food logging and something called a continuous glucose monitor. We do a lot with continuous glucose monitoring. It turns out your glucose can shift quite a bit. People spike to different foods. So we can follow all the molecules that were changing, correlate it with their activity, their glucose, their cortisol, all this stuff. And it turns out it's really super cool. You can do these time lag correlations. So you can see what events are associated with what other events um, and put a, build a time lag. And the idea is that early events are more likely to be causative of later events. So for example, steps always precede your heart rate going up <laughs> by one minute, it turns out. We can quantify that. So it's kind of cool. So we can follow, here's a good example. Your glucose goes up before you make this insulin C peptide. This is kind of obvious, but you can quantify in this person and, and see exactly what that number is. But you can follow all kinds of things like cortisol. And this might be relevant to this group. You can even follow people's medications and see how they're metabolizing and such. If you look at this, this one's quite interesting. This is a, a marker involved in, it's not a marker, it's a protein involved in Parkinson's. It's called alpha-synuclein. And we can follow its pattern 
it does correlate with glucose. We actually can correlate it with, we're trying to correlate it with stresses and, and personalized things. So imagine if you're at risk for Parkinson's, we think it's pretty powerful to be tracking this because then you might want to reduce those activities that stimulate this from happening. So I know this may not be so relevant for prostate, but you can see how I think these technologies could be adapted for this group for, for tracking you know, drugs and other things. And we've gone on to build these, these, this platform for pulling in the data, the wearable, clinical, whatever, so you can display it back to the user. We think it's pretty powerful. So uh, I have spun off companies on this. I can tell you more about that later. Sorry, this is from another presentation, a little accident there. One study we're doing that's kind of cool is we are, to something mentioned earlier, we are running a study to compare high intensity training versus um, endurance training on from people who start out sedentary to see which one leads to better you know, health outcomes, VO2 max and these, these molecular profiles. And we're also doing another study, this group that we're just waiting for approval on. We're actually trying to see if we can tell when people are getting cancer and how things are happening with a smartwatch, we think um, we're just trying to launch that one. So Brian, maybe you and I can talk more about that offline. That mm -hmm. might interest you, it might interest this group in general. We're very concerned about cancer recurrence. Uh, that's the group to start with. To be honest, we were setting it up around lung cancer, but I'm open to other uh, possibilities as well. So those are the sorts of things we do. Minimally, I think you folks could participate in the wearable study. We do do, it was mentioned earlier, we do try and follow the effects of exercise on people. We see their inflammatory response and other things after an acute bout. So, so yeah, we're trying to understand basic human physiology and human health using big data types approaches. So that should give you a little flair of what we're up to. And um, I don't know if I went on too long, but it should be about right. But um now I'm happy to take questions. I see the chat's loaded with something here. Yeah, well, I see there. Yeah, I just opened up lots of questions there. So <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure how you want to handle this, Brian. Just, should I just go through them? You want to read them? No, I, I, I'll, I'll go ahead and kick us off. Uh, All right. But first off, uh, thank you so much. This is uh, sort of like um, it's a, a, a array of different um, topics that I know people are going to have a lot of interest in. I have certainly many questions, but I'm going to um, yield the floor to other participants. Um, so the first is uh, coming in from uh, Rick Stanton, who talked to uh, want to know a little bit about how you're monitoring monocytes. So Rick, do you want to um, you want to get into that a little bit? You also saw some correlations between I think it was the MRI uh technology and human longevity which uh i know that they they do but anyway um rick you want to uh, talk to your tee up your questions did i get that right with monocytes uh, well i mentioned it that was when i was in yeah i was in norway for the lime they measured my monocytes to be honest we normally just follow the cbc panel that okay. you probably see for our routine stuff so so it's more standard sorts of things. I, I, I know neutrophils and some of the other things are in there. So, so we get, you know, something of a spectrum. Now we, with the RNA-seq, we can get pretty detailed, something called conv deconvolution analysis for exactly what immune cells you have in there for the bioinformatics in the crowd. They'll, no, they'll I, I, I know the uh, our package for immune deconv. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. yeah so but, you get it. Yeah. So we can but, follow this stuff pretty deeply if we want. Then I'm very curious because I only know how to do that from tissue. So I get the uh, um, transcripts per million or counts from Tempus, but that's yeah. from that's from tissue. Oh, uh, from prostate tissue. Is that what they're doing? Yeah. So I we. See. But you're saying you can get it from blood. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Because um, in fact, that's where it started. So you, 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 we normally start with the peripheral blood monocyte cells and we'll do RNA-seq. And then you can see the proportion of the different, you know, immune cells in there based on, you know, the presence of certain markers. It's a, well, it's what you were just saying, the deconvolution. Now. So that's actually where it started. It started at, out on PBMCs of blood and has since okay. moved into solid tissue. Yeah. Well, that's that's one of the challenges that prostate cancer patients face is that metastatic prostate cancer patients face is that uh, most of the metastases happen in bone, which make it very, very difficult to get 
uh, you can't get tissue. It's hard to get tissue. Uh, yeah. And so many of the prostate cancer patients on this call um, are in that situation. And so just to be clear, you're saying that you have a way to use blood to actually um, do RNA-seq analysis. And I think you also said proteomic analysis as well. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. We do mass spec, but we do a link as well now. This is a different form of, sorry, uh, proteomics. But So you can follow these markers. So I guess the question is what metastatic markers would show up in blood, right? And you right. probably, in, in this case, I think the key would be to do cell-free, I would assume. Is that right? Or do you think there are certain cells that are likely to be circulating? So well, I, I, I wish that we had a representative from M-Probe on um, Shino. I don't think that Shino is on. Uh, I'm happy to pursue this further offline if you want about what kinds of markers might show up. Uh, we might set up assays for. Again, I'm not a prostate. I guess that's why you have me on here to <laughs> see how we might, you know, interface and see if something good can come out of this. Happy, happy to pursue if there's certain markers we should be specifically targeting in the blood. You know, happy to consider that and, and see how we might adapt what we're doing for that sort of thing. Yeah, I think that they look at about 350 genes. So, for yeah. example, I know for, for me, they picked up HER2, they're picking up AR, they're picking up um, various other gene expressions. That is that from cell free RNA? Do you know, or is it from total? It's from, it's, it's from tissue. So he they they use so a, tissue. Yeah, yeah. That's the um, yeah. I'm a little bit familiar with um, what was it? They're now part of Exact Sciences, but the genome genome uh, test that was out there initially for prostate cancer, the 21 marker panel. Um, anyway, there there. Uh, I think we would. We could dig into that more offline if you want to hook me up with the experts. Uh, that's probably a gene expression signature, like you say, out of tissue. We'd have to see what parts of those markers might show up in blood if you wanted to. Okay. Well, if, if you could do that, you you would really solve a huge problem for advanced right. metastatic prostate cancer patients. Um, okay. The other thing that's also interesting is that the advantage of prostate cancer is that we have PSA, so we can track our uh, PSA over time. Right. Everybody, every every prostate cancer patient on this call is tracking through Excel. All of I've had data. mine tracked too. Uh, <laughs> I totally got it. Yep. Yeah. So, so like all of the other data that you're getting correlate to that, so you could look at you know progression regression of what's right. happening with cancer. It's a proxy, but it's a pretty good proxy. I um, bet we should be able to do that with microsampling too. I'd be surprised if we could. Now we haven't tried. I don't, uh, that's not one of the things we're assaying in that microsampling, but I'll, I'll bet our test could be adapted for that. Okay, but there's going to be a lot so of... I would say, why do you hook me up with some of the relevant folks for what kinds of markers we might track that'd be relevant to your group if you wanted to hook me up with the experts there, Brian? That would be great. Or anyone else on the call. My, I'll put my email in the chat. I don't mind people reaching out. I do get a little busy, but usually okay. weekend I can catch up. So Okay, cool. I, I, so I will raise my hand to, as, yes, as yes, one, just of, gonna get to you. <laughs> one of the people on the call who is super interested in... I can put my video on us also. So we are um, we doing RNA seq in in blood, right? Oh, we're doing RNA seq in tissue, mm -hmm. uh, but we are interested in moving it into to blood. But sure. we have a way to deconvolute the data, um, sure. and we have uh, taken the first step into blood, um, but basically asking the question: What is normal? Right? That's sure. our first question and i think you can help me answer that question too uh, because of all the data you got um so i will definitely love to follow up sure uh, are you doing well, cell free question, rna then or are you doing we, uh, so so the we just do we can do anything right yeah. all right we, we clear, clear the lab but we have to sure. make decisions in terms of what what is it that we're going after and right. based on what I know at this point, it's you want to do whole blood and uh, mRNA sequencing. So that was my question to you, what kind of sequencing you are doing, um, because we can also analyze your data. Yeah, sure. So we've been doing yeah. mostly out of the peripheral blood monocyte cells, just sequencing everything there. Now we do save an aliquot of blood to be able to do cell-free RNA. We have some other 
diabetes related mm -hmm. projects for that. Um, Cause we're looking, right. we're trying to look for kidney failure or things like that. So right. uh, like you say, it can be adapted right now, just the way we're structured because we're mostly doing health profiling is to look at PBMC. Right. Now, when we do the micro sampling, that's whole blood. That's yeah. because you just, just the nature of the way you collect the sample. Yeah, so so there now yeah. I predict that the sensitivity of that assay from microsampling might be too low for RNA seq. Yeah, we looked very, very into small. yeah we looked so how is it two hundred fifty microliter? No, it's only ten microliters. We'll take two spots, Ooh. so twenty microliters. Okay. So I think it's probably okay. too low to look specifically for yeah. for like RNA cancer samples. So you may need regular blood draws for that. There are other devices though. Paso devices that will draw maybe up to mil and one yeah. could explore whether that's good. This is obviously very researchy. Uh, for yeah. 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 Okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, okay. yeah, yeah, sure. And somebody asked about well, human longevity. I think what QBio does is where the human longevity is very focused on the genome just because uh, Craig Ventra is kind of what he did. We actually even though I'm chair of genetics, believe it or not, I actually think these other things, metabolomics and such, are just as important in their own right. You don't have to interpret. Like we can see a mitochondrial defect from a metabolomics mm -hmm. profile without being able to figure out what's wrong with the genome, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. So we're, yeah. we're trying to understand health in its own, if, if, as though each piece of data, we call it features, is contributing to a picture of that without trying to, Pigeon, pigeonhole ourselves into one, like the genomic space. So when, when human longevity does it, they'll look at a met metabolomics profile and then they'll try and interpret it in light of the genome. And sometimes that works, but all, just as often as not, it fails miserably. But we think, again, just doing it on its own can be very, very powerful. Okay, Brian, I don't know. Do you want to take hands or you want to go to the next question? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch between hands and, um, and uh, okay. what's in the chat. So uh, Richard, I see your hand up, but I'm going to um, ask Russ to chime in. He's got questions about heart rate. Uh, Russ, do you want to tee those up? Yes, I do. Well, um, let's see. With the heart rate, it's, it's, is an increase also, uh, you know, it predicts COVID or can predict COVID in, in some cases. Does it predict Cold, stress, flus, it other does. illnesses. Uh, yeah. uh, does it increase uh, before if you have sleep deprivation or poor sleep? Does heart rate tend to increase and show you that, or yeah, maybe so, stress from exercising too much? Yeah, no. So, the, so other colds, meaning respiratory viruses, things like rhinoviruses, influenza, it'll pick up that in advance of symptoms as well. Now, there the the. the the early warning is probably about 12 hours, sometimes 24. And that's because they the pre-symptomatic period for most respiratory viruses is not very long. It just so happens for COVID, it's quite long, which is you know useful for us to detect with the smartwatch. It's bad for people because they're spreading it around without knowing it uh, when they're running around pre-symptomatically. So the answer is it does pick up other colds. And I mentioned workplace stress. It does follow it, it it identifies that too without people often realizing they have that they kind of if they see the red alert they kind of say oh yeah i have been stressed today so it's it, these are real signals these jump up in heart rates they're real yeah and i mentioned the exercise so again just doing your morning run or whatever won't trigger it typically uh, it, but if you run a marathon, your heart rate will be up several days. So something excessive over what you normally do by a fair amount is what it will take to trigger these alarms. Because we build the baseline around your personal habits. Does that make sense? So uh, yes, it does. Yeah. Something unusual. Yeah. Wait, Brian, uh, can uh, I just also, also, could, could I just uh, I just have one, like one more yeah. kind of a major question here, but it's about micro sampling. I'm wondering mm -hmm. how often you can do it realistically, the cost of it, the turnaround time, is it available? Could it be done in Phoenix? And uh, um, I have lots of questions about the parameters. Maybe I should address those offline with you. Yeah, I'll send, so uh, obviously we're doing this as a research study here. One of the companies we spun off, it's called YOLO, I-O-L-L-O. -L -L -O. They do basically a targeted quantitative assay that measures over 500 metabolites. And, and I can send a sign-up link to Brian and you guys okay. can go visit it. 
And that, it's interesting, a lot of these information is actionable. It'll give you back a readout. Now it's about 30 different things that'll read out like depression. They're markers for a lot of these things. It's not a medical test. I do want to, <laughs> it goes back to Brian's introduction here. It's a wellness test that kind of gives you, that sees the levels of these metabolites, many of which are correlated with sort of immune and metabolic health and things like that. And actually to some extent, mental health. So, so you, yeah, so, so feel free to take a look at it. The cost on that, don't overly quote me, but it's around $290, as I recall, something in that range uh, for one of these tests. You, and you sample at home, you mail it in, and they give you back the results. So, um, yeah, so that's how we're trying to get, so I'm a believer academics, we're really great at research, we're really great at proof of principle, we're absolutely no good at scaling, and this is what companies are for. And so given where I am in Silicon Valley, it's not that hard to start a company to try to get the stuff out. And that's how we're approaching it. And, and same thing, the micro sampling we also were using for, we have a company spun off around long COVID, trying to manage, diagnose and manage long COVID, which is very complicated if any of you have have ever had you know experience with this or have family members who have it. It's very, very complicated. And so we we're using... A, a decision support structure along with the micro sampling to better try and manage these patients. That's, that's our goal. So, yeah. Great. Great question. So yeah, next. Thank Richard. you. So uh, ahead, Richard, you've got your, you got your hand up, Richard. Sorry. I mean, I'm, I'm going to go to Richard and then I'll Great. come to you. Great. Thank you. Um, th yeah. This is really uh, impressive stuff. Uh, I just had a couple of sort of functional questions. So this is like a, uh, and I apologize, I missed the very beginning of it. Um, no worries. This is a, a basically a finger stick capillary blood draw system that people can do at home, and then it has a fix yep. it or something. You just send it off. Um, how many analytes can you do simultaneously? Yeah, so twenty two hundred. Oh, um, simultaneous. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, well, we do. We run four assays on twenty these two. 20 microliters of blood, basically. Yeah, so it's steep. It's mass spectrometry. So we can do this. I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, uh, I'll say the bad word here. It's Theranos that works because <laughs> we're not trying to make, we're, we're using a very sophisticated, large instrument. We're not trying to squeeze this thing into some small box. And so we can measure many, many analytes. Now we don't measure everything. So for example, we don't measure LDL and HDL. You'll have to get that through your normal but we do measure a lot of stuff that we think is valuable. So for example, we can measure cortisol and all these cytokines. These are important immune molecules that most people don't measure. So we, we pick up a lot of stuff we think is valuable and that's gonna be particularly useful for we think for just general wellness monitoring, hence the yellow, and then also for this long COVID uh, company. So I'll just put these in if it interests any of you or uh, Brian can send around a, a little, I'll send a little, thing. And again, this is, I'm totally conflicted. So don't feel like you have to do any of this stuff, but it, it's just people often ask me about but, it. So. But you're measuring all of these analytes from one, not even a blood draw, it's a capillary blood draw, you yeah. know, very small volume and you get 2,200 analytes, you can yep. do them all. I don't suppose you can do a CBC. Uh, not really because the cells will lice on the, the way we collect the blood. You'd have to do that separate. There probably is a way that hasn't been a priority for us. I should point out, though, that that's what we do in the lab where we're profiling very deep. YOLO will probe basically over 500 metabolites, not the whole 2,200. But, you know, the 500 is pretty good. So, uh, yeah, and, and Rhythm's doing, they're, they're, they're doing cytokines plus. Um, uh, and when you... And when you do all of these measurements, do you have a validation about um, capillary blood, which, you know, has all that cell debris and other stuff in it versus, um, you know, a, a blood, a standard blood drug? We do. I can send, we, we published a paper on this in, in January. I'm happy to send it to you. And of course, feel free to tweet it out and advertise our stuff, but <laughs> just kidding. No, the uh, uh, same thing. Maybe I can send that to you as well, Brian. The the paper is circulate. So it actually describes the difference between whole blood from these finger pricks versus plasma, like you would do in a doctor's office. And uh, most things correlate, but there's some things that are off, and we know which ones aren't the same. Now, 
just because it's off it. doesn't mean that's a bad measurement. It's just a different measurement. And so you would have to recalibrate, if you know what I mean, if you're going to use that. And if it's ultimately going to find its way into the health system, one just would to have to. But but right now, but but a lot of stuff is spot on, meaning that what you see in the plasma is fine, the same as whole blood. So wow. and you'll see a we have a correlation curve in the paper that you can take a look at. If again, if you're a scientist, you'll know how to interpret that. And the data are all available. One thing I, I'd like to point out, we always make our data available so that people can work with it and you know. Well, well that's really reproducible and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah. Thank you very much. That's sure. really impressive. And I, I will tweet it out and both my followers will be <laughs> Oh, <laughs> fantastic. Oh, okay. I really was kidding, but all right. <laughs> I can always use I'll do my best to increase that by 33%. So <laughs> <laughs> okay, sure. I don't know, Brian, you wanna uh yeah, so there's a question uh, that Amit had regarding uh hemoglobin uh, so i mean you want to see that up yeah sure i was kind of just following up on russ's question on the heart rate uh, monitoring issue right me low hemoglobin leads to you know um, your vesting heart rate to move up and uh, in a sustained manner just like what you were showing with covid so this seemed like there are multiple things that can lead to vesting heart rate you know, uptick in resting heart rate. So how can, does the app have ability to actually, you know, do precision pointing or it is, hey, resting heart rate is up and, you know, talk to your doctor because something else, something is going on here. Yeah, no, great question. I, I think you're spot on. It's kind of like a check engine light in a car. The right. light goes on. So you're not a hundred percent sure what's off, but much of it you can contextualize. Like if you were just, if you're traveling, right, if, or if you go up in the mountains, your the blood oxygen is lower and your heart rate will go up to compensate. So you can contextualize, you know, right away you just say, all right, I was just hiking in the mountains. Of course, my heart rate's up. Or I just ran a marathon. So a lot of it you can just subtract out. But if you're just sitting around listening to boring Mike Snyder and your heart rate's running high, something's off. <laughs> you're either coming down with something, you're stressed. Uh, something's not right. It's a very sensitive marker. And I will, I'd like to point out that, you know, this is a, a, another one of my, uh, if you will, digs at medicine. I'm going to insult some people here, I'm sure. But we've been using temperature as a measure for whether people are ill or not, right? That's a 300-year-old concept. But um, it's actually not a great one because for COVID, half the people don't get a fever, yet we still use it. Right. And and you walk, right? You walk up to a place, they shine the infrared light on. First of all, it's cold outside. The measurement's worthless. It just always comes out too low. Um, and they wave you in anyway. And then if they stick a thermometer in your mouth, well, you may not get a fever anyway from COVID, but your heart rate, I guarantee, nearly always goes up. So we think resting heart rate, it's not as specific. It's there's no question, but it's like temperature. Temperature doesn't always tell you this well. But I know we can improve that in the future, meaning I know with as we're measuring respiration from these devices, so I'm, I'm wearing my four smartwatches here, as you measure, as we pull more data, I'm pretty confident we'll be able to tell the difference between workplace stress and a respiratory viral infection, right? There are going to be very different signals. I already know we can tell the difference between a bacterial, like the Lyme signal, and a respiratory virus, because the features are very, very different. So is so, that... Go is ahead. that uh, just a quick thing? Is this available? Uh, uh, this app is available for us to try it out. I, uh, yeah. So uh, sign up for a study. It's a research study. So you sign up. But we have tens of thousands of people all signed up. So um, I'll put that in the chat too. But you can also um, I'll, I'll give it to Brian to send around as well. And I'm typing it in now. But I can answer questions while we're still going here. While, while you're um, typing that out, Mike, I'm just going to add a little bit of context to the importance of heart rate monitoring. Yep. Um, so I had, I'll make this brief, and then we've got other people that have their hands up. But um, I had surgery in November to remove a lesion from my bladder. Um, everything was going fine. Then about a month and a half later, I was sitting resting, and I noticed that my, my heart rate was just elevated. You know, normally my heart rate's below 60. And it was um, approaching 70, just sitting, doing nothing. 
And then I thought, you know, I better take my blood pressure. I took my blood pressure. My blood pressure was through the roof. It was like 180 over 110. Wow. Yeah. So went to the ER. Long story short, what happened was the lesion that they removed, they didn't get everything, started to grow back, was compressing my ureter, creating a blockage in my kidney. My, my kidney was beginning to fail, creating, wow. you know, this whole issue related to. So anyway... The point is that um, heart rate monitoring, If had I been more attuned to it, I might have been able to address it faster. Yeah, and, and but did you see it pre-symptomatically, even when you first went up or not really? Or are you getting- I started? didn't, no, I, I, wasn't, yeah. I wasn't really- A lot of people, yeah, I've had people come up to me who have said, um, because I'm a big believer in this, and Mike, I listened to your talk and, and you know, I was, one day I saw my heart rate jumping, <laughs> just abnormally high, just like you described, Brian. And, and so they went to a physician who said, oh, well, there's nothing wrong with you, blah, 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 but it wouldn't go down. So they went back. And sure enough, they had a strep infection that, um, you know, the, the physician just didn't catch. And, and the, again, this is a very sensitive measure. If you know your baseline and something's shifting like that dramatically, something's wrong. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we have other examples from other people in our cohort. This hundred nine, I can give you a whole bunch of examples. But this longitudinal measuring the shift up is a big deal. Even if you're in the normal range, you can see this big shift up, and you're still in the normal. Something may be off, and that happened with one of our cohort members. Probably better keep moving here. <laughs> yeah, who you want to pick next, Brian? Yeah, uh, Jason. Uh, Jason's been uh, waiting patiently. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, so two things. One is I was one of the, the first folks in Chicago to come down with COVID. And I went to the ER and ended up being in bed for, for a couple months, but I never had a temperature. I was actually, my temperature yeah. was a degree lower than, than normal. But anyway, so that, that's not the question. So, um, you know, listening to the, to the talk and some of the things that you're measuring and, and, and whatnot, have you, are you familiar um, with a, the Wim Hof method with like deep breathing and, and like code exposure. I'm curious what your thoughts are based upon, you know, all the, the work that you're doing. I'm just learning about that stuff. It's an area that's a bit of a hole in our studies, the whole mental health. We're just kind of adding that now. So uh, I've been reading a lot about these breathing techniques. There's one out of Stanford. That might be the one you're talking about where you go. <laughs> you do Actually, this is different. The gentleman, it's a, a guy out of, uh, out of Holland. Yeah. Oh, okay. Maybe but anyway, I'm a believer. Anyways. Yeah, I'm a believer in this stuff because apparently it's affecting your parasympathetic neurons, and it really has a very positive impact on your mental health. And so, from what I've been reading, it does look right to me. I don't think it's bullshit. I've seen other stuff out there. I can tell you that I think is bullshit. Uh, that one, it really there is some logic to it. And I've also, you know, again, I. I think what we want to see are these large proper trials and that would really make things a lot more convincing. And, but I think we're in this early phase and as those trials happen, then hopefully they get incorporated. Now the cold stuff, I honestly don't know. People talk about some of this as being anti-inflammatory, like the, um, you know, what do you call it? The hyperbaric uh, um, chambers and things. I, I did it once just for fun. <laughs> and uh, it's supposed to help with your inflammation. And I have no idea, you know, psychologically, it, I guess I said, wow, that was quite something. <laughs> but I don't know. But we, again, we need to see proper trials right around us. And I've seen it for the hyperbaric oxygen stuff too, about being very useful for people. So we'll have to, oh, look, Russ has one in here about that, I guess. Anyway, we'll, we'll uh, I, I'd love to see proper trials run around this. I suspect there's a, a, something to all these. And I think the breathing one, by the way, it really does help people with stress is my understanding. So, yeah, they're thinking, I guess there's been some, uh, not the, the best scientific study, but, uh, you know, around some of the antibody levels increase after some of these like 20, 40 minutes worth of deep breathing. But anyway, I'll, I'll just drop a plug that if I have, some of my friends are in that area. So if you actually want okay. to do a proper trial, you can reach yeah, out. Yeah, we're, we're starting to. Yeah, and I want to run them big enough. They're often run with like 10 people or something. So so in the end, nobody gets convinced by it. So you really need, and I think combining it with the micro sampling. So we're running some depression studies that are really powerful, we think, where we're doing, we're put, having people do an intervention and then doing micro sampling or we're following their inflammation markers, changing that sort of, and metabolic change. It's pretty cool. 
So I think that's what's going to lead to, you know, people believing this stuff when we could show biochemical and other sorts of changes with enough people in it that convinces folks. So, yeah. Well, it, it, believe isn't the right answer. Just figure out whether or not it works and if it doesn't work. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. That's, that's correct. Yeah, better phrasing. Thanks, Jason. Yeah. I want to be mindful of time. Um, Mike, I don't if know. We go you a few feel, extra minutes, but if, can, uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, I see that Eric's got his hand up. I think he wanted, wants to talk about using wearable to detect the recurrence of cancer and maybe a few other things. Sure. Yeah, I got a couple of quick questions. So let me follow up on the heart rate we were talking about before. So, so number one, I have a pacemaker for bradycardia. So okay. it keeps my resting heart rate at 60 and not, not going any lower. Do, would, would this app work with, with that? I don't think so. Cause I think you're fixed. Yeah, is that right? Your your heart rate is fixed. So I don't. I well, don't... My, my, the lower end is fixed, but oh, the lower it'll end allow it to go oh, up. Then above probably 60. Would, yeah, then maybe it would work. Yeah, I don't yeah, know. It just you, won't allow maybe... it. Bradycardia means slow heart rate. My heart rate used to get down into the twenties. Okay, so overnight. it only has a yeah, it has a bottom limit. Yeah. It has a bottom. I won't let it go below yeah. sixty. Oh, okay. Well, then if it yeah, <clears throat> we could see you could try and see what you think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you'd be an interesting case for us. <laughs> Second question on, around that: Does it work with an aura ring? That's what I'm wearing as yeah, a wearable does. right now. Okay. So other people are using that um, aura ring samples a little bit lower frequency than um, and but and we like to integrate data from all. Some people only wear their ring at night, so do try and wear it all the time. Yeah, I wear mine. We all like time. to capture as much data as okay. possible. So we'll, we'll give it a shot. We don't have as much data on aura ring, but they're. Now other groups have published about aura ring detecting COVID, um, again, okay. respectively. Last question then, I know we're getting short on time, is I think I heard you mention something about using a wearable to potentially detect a cancer recurrence. Did, did I hear that right? In your yeah, you did. We're trying to launch a study where we're just waiting for the IRB. You know, it's kind of interesting. IRBs, for those of you who have to deal with this stuff, they, this has been going on for nine months to get approval. But there are reasons why we think we've, we've actually, believe it or not, tried it out on a mouse. And now we want to try it on people uh, to see if we can pick up cancer, the early detection and or recurrence through a wearable. Because same thing, your heart rate may shift and something called heart rate variability, which, by the way, that's the, the deviation between heartbeats. It, it, you're healthy if you have deviation. <laughs> Which mine is low because of the pacemaker. <laughs> it doesn't yeah. let it go. So, I don't know if it's kept that way that once you go above that ceiling. Anyway, heart rate variability is another good measure of health. So we're pulling in all those data and I don't know if it's going to work, but I think it'll work at some level. The question is, will it work early, yeah, right? Can we do early detection? I don't know. And that, that's why we're rolling a study out. But you never know, right? Who knew you could detect infection pre- symptomatically with, with a smartwatch. And I didn't show you, but we actually, for, through machine learning and some other advanced methods, we can tell people's red blood cell count, not a clinical grade measurement, but their hemoglobin, their hemocrit, their, their red blood cell count from a smartwatch because of the kinds of measurements it's taking. Even to some extent, fasting glucose we can get from a smartwatch on a wrist. It's Again, it's not a clinical grade measurement, but it's good enough to, to detect shifts. And it's because you're collecting very interesting data. And you think about your, your watch is actually zooming in on your blood, actually. It's doing spectroscopic measurements on your blood. So it can measure these things. So I think these are going to get more and more powerful in the future. And, and we did that from a 2015 watch. <laughs> so eight years ago now, I'm sure wow. we can do better with today's watches. So, interesting so Michael, discussion. Thank you. A, a quick last comment. Uh, from here sure. i love what you're doing by the way i um, the Thank more you. the data the better but i'm also a scientist so i can't get enough of Great. it um uh, so uh, one thing that i think could be really cool would be temperature like continuous temperature monitoring not just because it's important in order to um be able to uh, catch early infections but also cancer. Yeah, so, no, we okay. the, yeah, that's on the watches, believe it, skin temperature, which is yeah. some reflection of, of your internal. I'm not exactly the same as I'm sure you know, but it, but it's not bad. 
And some of the devices, my company's device is actually quite accurate on skin temperature, which is nice. So we are we are made, we are bringing that in, and that's actually one of the features we build into our models for both uh, infectious disease and and the cancer detection. So that's the hope, and we think it's a big deal for diabetes too. It has to do with how you burn your energy, right? Yeah. In metabolism in general, yeah, I think yep. it's super. Interesting. Yeah. No, There's thank you for that yeah, comment. It's so it's... easy to to obtain if it's yep. in... Yeah, we get it from the watch. As I said, we don't do it. it ultimately, there'll be implantables and then we'll get it a different way. <laughs> right All right now, we're, thank you. everything's on the wrists or fingers. Yeah. Okay. Well, Brian, are there any more questions or what are you thinking here? So I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. And... Um...